wanted to start off by uh, just kind of telling you the story of Qualcomm. I, I assume people know the name more than just the stadium, right? <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, the company started with seven people. My father was one of the key people who started it uh, back in 1985. And the way that I like to tell the story of the company is about vision, because the way I like to run the company is by articulating a vision for people to follow, because that keeps me from having to run the company by telling everybody, you do this, you do that, you do this. When you run it with a vision, then people figure out themselves sort of how their projects integrate. And then when you want to innovate, people know, okay, well, this is something in the area that we want to go for, and this maybe is something that's sort of not something that we want to pursue. So really try and focus in on, on how the vision of the company works. And I came up with a saying when I was running the handset business, which is to lead through vision and not division. Because one of the ways that people often try and lead groups is by constructing us versus them. So it's easy to have your team form around you if you say, we're the good guys and those people over there are the idiots. And we, you know, we're going to do great and they're not. And the, what I learned from that period of time of my life was when I did that and I said, we're great and those infrastructure guys, they don't know what they're doing, then everybody in, in our company, I'm sorry, in my group then said, oh, well, I'm going to model the leader. I'm going to do the same thing myself. And I'm going to say, um, hey, I'm in sales and the uh, engineering guys, they're messed up. Or I'm in marketing and the finance people are messed up. And so you see people model leadership and do this division thing below. So, so I really focused in on what it is that you can do that brings people together and causes them to work together. And running with a vision is really the key thing. And the other nice thing about vision, as opposed to, for example, a very detailed strategic plan, which we do not do, at Qualcomm, um, is then people know what, ha what they should do when they run into obstacles. So I liken it to sort of a map versus a compass. A compass tells you the direction that you're going. The map tells you sort of what road to follow. And of course, to make a map, people have already been there before. So a lot of times you want to go where people haven't been, particularly in the tech industry. So with those kind of thoughts in mind, let me just give you an outline of the company how it started and sort of where, it, where it's gone to and what we think the future is. And the first thing that happened, the first vision was really not really a vision. It was just a set of people who came together knowing digital communications theory. And it was people who had come from a previous company. Uh, that company had uh, used digital communications theory for military and space applications because at the time it was quite expensive. And so only those applications could actually use this kind of computation in a device and so forth. But when Qualcomm got started, the price, Moore's Law, drove the cost of computation down. And therefore, you could use it for commercial and consumer applications. And even then, we had people questioning whether some of these applications could actually be done without a van full of electronics and so forth. But we proved that, it, that these things could. And the very first thing that we did was a, a system for messaging the long haul trucks. Uh, we used satellite transponders. Um, our competition actually wanted to launch dedicated satellites for this. Uh, our guys figured out how to use this theory to use uh, existing TV transponders. And you can imagine the kind of cost differential for our company selling against somebody else who had to support the building of that satellite, the cost of, of both building it and of maintaining it, and so forth, whereas we were just renting transponder time from TV satellites that were up there already. So that was sort of the first thing. And we actually still have that, that business today. There were a whole set of things that they thought about doing with this digital communications theory in those old days, in the early days. They didn't actually start with, a, with any product thought at all. It was just the theory, they knew things would, would come. Uh, but they were looking at using a particular technology for communicating to the satellites. And one day after pitching it, uh, my father and another engineer were driving down the freeway from LA, and they realized that you could use it for uh, cellular technology. And at the time, the industry was using just analog phones, which none of you know what I'm talking about, that they used to be analog. And, uh, and they were hitting what they called the capacity brick wall. 
They couldn't get enough people on the system for the amount of demand, so they wanted to go digital. And the industry had decided on a certain digital technology. We came in later with a new one and that was based on this idea. And we had what was called the, the religious wars back then. Um, and though the echoes of those wars, I would say, have mostly dissipated today, but there's still, every so often, you hear a little echo, somebody who still remembers those old days and has some resentment because one way or another on the, in, in those, uh, those wars, people's you know, businesses got hurt or their feelings got hurt or whatever it was. Anyways, this system was a, a packet data system. I actually did the speech part of the system, and it was done as data. So much like you do today when you send voice over IP, it was much like that. It wasn't IP that we were running it over, but it was all compressed and digitized and, and so forth. And we realized that we could turn it into a data system. And so very early on, in the early 90s, we put uh, the internet protocols into the phone. And, uh, and so the next thing that we did was really focus in on wireless internet being a more profound impact on the world than the wired internet. And people didn't believe that for a very long time. You know, the operators, when we tried to put the wireless internet into the phone, they said, people want to talk on it. You know, what, what's the internet? What's the value of that? And when we finally got them to put data in it, they said, uh, you know, it has to be like a dial-up modem. And we said, fine, we'll put the internet protocols in the middle, and we'll put this other stuff on the outside that makes it look like what you want. The next year, we pulled that stuff out and just had a browser connecting directly into the internet, and we were sort of off and running. But that was the next big thing for us, was really going and pushing that. And the nice thing about that was we didn't really have to strategize that much to figure out what was good for the company. And I, I would argue to you that many companies that you see that are successful and fast moving are able to do that because they don't have to minutely optimize their strategy. In our case, we knew that anything that drove wireless data was good for us because we did wireless data better than anybody else. Much like Google today knows that anything they do that drives search is good for them because that's where their money flows in from. And so I've seen the, you know, many companies in the, in the wireless industry where they got into a position where an opportunity presented itself and they sat around for a long time trying to figure out, well, if I optimize this or that, I'll have a little bit of an advantage here or there. And by the time they actually decided to move, the, somebody else had already gotten them before them, gotten there before them, and the opportunity was gone. So, so you gotta, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be ready to move. And if you have something which you know is the fundamental thing that you can use, that's that's you know a wonderful place to be. And we were in that place. Okay, so after we started working on the internet, we said, okay, what are you gonna use it for on the phone? And this was back at a time when people were saying things like, oh, you're putting too many features into the phone, what do I need to, you know, all this stuff for? But we had a fundamental belief that the phone would turn out the way that it is, which is it's a personal device not just for communication, but for entertainment and productivity and all these other kinds of things. So very long time ago, we started putting in microprocessor technology. You know, we were known just as a radio company. And now we were putting microprocessor technology and graphics and sensors. And you know, th there was a time when, when phones did not have cameras or color screens. And we had to actually fight to get the operators to agree that those kinds of things should go in. We put GPS in. GPS actually got into the phone not for location services, but simply because the government wanted to know when you made a 911 call from your cellular phone where you were to go help you out. And by the way, the government was incredibly poor at implementing their side of the system. The phones all had the capability far before the, the service centers that the government ran could actually take that data and, and get you know, somebody to you in the right place. In any case, that was the early impetus for getting GPS. And I'll tell you, the operators at that time were so worried about privacy implications, for many, many years they didn't allow uh, location-based applications on the, on the phone. Anyways, during that time, this was a time when we built the, our software platform, an app do downloading platform. We built the first smartphone with the Palm operating system uh, running on, and all these kinds of early innovations that we now see as you know, fundamentally part of the wireless internet. So today, everybody gets this. They all realize that the phone is this thing that's so personal for us. They realize that you want to put more and more stuff into the phone. And so the vision 
now has evolved. And the vision for us right now is one that we call the digital sixth sense, which is there is stuff in the world around us. There's content, there are services, there are certainly people that we want to interact with, and there's cyberspace information associated with those people or locations or things. And we actually want to be able to detect when we're in proximity of something that might be of interest to us and control it. And so you may have heard of the Internet of Things where all things around us are going to be connected. Um, we call it the Internet of Everything because we believe that it's, you know, it's basically going to be fundamental that things will be connected uh, in the world around you. And the phone is going to sit there. It's going to be your way of detecting what's around you and controlling what's around you and authenticating yourself to things um, and places and people. And so this is kind of the next area that we're, we're working on. And, and the numbers are pretty staggering. There's estimates that there will be 24 billion connected things by 2020. Uh, half of those will be cellular connected. Others will be connected in various different ways. But, but that's sort of the vision that we're working on right now. And you can see the early stages of these things. You, you know, I'm wearing a, a Nike Fuel Band, this Bluetooth to my device and uploads my activity levels. But you can imagine where that will head in the future. Take healthcare in, in, in particular. We're working with a researcher that has a device that's small enough that it will get injected into your arm. And two weeks ahead of time, it can detect certain things flowing in your blood to tell you that you're going to have a heart attack. So imagine in the future your phone will ring and tell you to go to the doctor and, and get checked up because you're going to have a heart attack. And, and people say, oh, nobody's going, to will, nobody's going to be willing to have technology put inside their body. But in fact, that happens already today. There's been studies on pacemakers that a connected pacemaker has 50% lower mortality rate than a disconnected pacemaker. And so there is a reason that we will have mobile health, and you heard I'm doing this ambassadorship. It was a, actually, interestingly enough, a program started by Desmond Tutu. And he was interested in mobile health and e-health because in the developing world, there's just not enough access to health care. And with 6.6 .6 billion mobile connections, the mobile phone is the biggest technology platform. So he understood that making use of sort of mankind's biggest platform was his way of providing health care to people. And we, we recognize that ourselves, by the way. We've done a lot of work in the mobile health area. Um, one of the things that you may or may not know is that there's a $10 million X prize. Do you guys know the X prize? Yes, no. I know the X prize. OK, for those who don't know the X Prize, what the, X, the first X Prize was um, they launched a, a, a spacecraft, a reusable space, spacecraft, and it had to be able to carry three people up to a certain altitude, come down and be reused within a certain period of time. And that took a long time to win. And now that technology is being used by Virgin Galactic, and they're going to start commercial uh, space flights. The one that we did was around the tricorder from Star Trek, you know, the box where you wave it over people and it tells them, you know, how healthy they are. And the thing is that that technology is available basically today. So there are sensors that are being done by people. There is software and decision support systems that are being done by people. And what we wanted to do was create a moment, much like the iPhone created for the mobile internet, when all of a sudden it became very mainstream. We wanted to create that for mobile health. And so our thought is if we can get groups of people to come together, these global teams to come together and create something, and the idea is that this box, less than five pound box, will be able to diagnose 15 diseases better than a panel of doctors. And we're going to have this prize competition in, in um, basically three years from now. Um, let's see, the number of teams that are working on it right now is, uh, 285 teams from, from 35 countries. So it's really a global competition. And we'll see, I think, mobile health really uh, take off. And the, all of these things are consistent with this vision. So I have a group of people that are in the company, and they came up with the idea for a product in the mobile health space. And it wasn't because I went and said to them, here, this is the area that you have to go work in. And because this is in our strategic plan as the thing that we're doing 
right now was because they understood that they, we wanted to find innovation within that area and they thought around, they talked with customers, they worked through a bunch of different projects and they came up with that one. So I think you know, th this notion of, of vision-led and also the other notion that I, that I said, that I mentioned around the XPRIZE is the notion of catalyzing other people to do stuff. And so we spend a lot of time trying to look for places where we're not necessarily going to deliver the things to the customer, the end customer, but if we start off with some project, other people will see it and then they'll jump on board and drive things. And the smartphone is a, is a perfect example of that. The fact that we're sitting in the position that we're sitting in right now, able to supply into the vast majority of smartphones is because we helped create that industry and then when it really took off, we were there with the right products to, to go into it. Uh, maybe um, maybe I'd go from kind of the vision to what what that actually then turned into in, in, in terms of the company. So this is a global, you know, you guys are looking at global business. We are clearly a global business. Um, right now we have 188 locations around the world. Uh, 78 of those locations are in the United States. We have about 27,000 employees. Um, about one third of them are, are outside the United States, two thirds in the United States, about 12,000 in San Diego where we started. 65% um, of our employees are engineers. Uh, we do a huge internship program. We'll, do, we'll have 12, 1,200 interns at Qualcomm uh, this summer and that's the main way that we hire outside of, or, and by the way, not just for engineers, uh, also for business people too. Uh, that's the main way that we hire out of colleges is have people come and do internships. You get to know us, we get to know you. Uh, that, that actually works out extremely well. The other thing that's interesting is we have 118 different nationalities in our workforce right now. So it is a very, very global workforce and you say, okay, well how do you manage such a global workforce? And, and the truth of the matter is we work very hard at it. We, for a long time we had a, an office, our first office was actually in Israel, uh, international office in Israel, and for probably 10 years Every year we thought about shutting it down because just we didn't get the engagement and we had to figure out how to make this work. And the, the lessons that we learned there, the best thing that we learned was that if you're going to have an office outside, a remote office, the best thing you need to do is make sure that it has a mission. Because once it has a mission, it has a set of projects that are continuing. They can build sort of deep professionalism around certain areas. If you act if you leave a global office to be sort of a job shop, then people are just in and out on different projects all the time. They don't build up the levels of trust that you need with the main organization in San Diego and, and therefore um, it doesn't work. And so you just kind of, you, you lack the ability to measure achievement in a global office. Uh, so we've, we've organized ourselves that way. If you look around, actually not just internationally, but uh, all of our offices have some mission that they're associated with or some set of missions. And that's actually created the linkages both at the very top and all the way down through the organization to make a very high bandwidth connection. And the reason why that's important is that the way that information flows at Qualcomm is very non-hierarchical. It's quite unstructured. We rely very heavily on email. We've always been an email culture. And Information doesn't necessarily even flow to me as the CEO if, not, if I'm not providing value in a conversation, in a thread on some topic. And so when you talk about a global office, the ability to build the trust and the thought that, okay, this person needs to be looped into this conversation has to happen only through building the trust. And by the way, it's also made it quite difficult for people to come in from the outside. If they come in from an organization that has a very hierarchical mindset, uh, it, they always bounce off and the antibodies form and those people end up not being successful at the company. And so it's really quite important for people who come into the organization to be very open, very willing to accept input from a lot of diverse um, sources to go build their networks up within the company. And in fact, when we do our onboarding for executives or board members or new employees, I mean, that, that that part of it is uh, stressed highly. 
And the reason why that works so well is that in an innovation, a very fast-paced organization, you just have to be very flexible and be able to organize and reorganize around the people who have the knowledge to go solve the issues. And that has worked extremely, extremely well for us. Um, people like the culture. I mean, we've been on the best places to work list for 15 years in a row. And, uh, and, and I think you know, this, this notion that um, the company is, we don't have um, big facilities. We don't have big factories. Uh, we actually are all about people and their ideas. In fact, even in our chipset business, um, we don't actually make the chips. We have, we're at what's called fabulous. And so some other manufacturer makes the chips for us. And so what our engineers are creating are virtual things. They are the designs of the chips as opposed to the manufacturing of a thing. And in, in our licensing business, uh, people are creating ideas, and that, that's what we're licensing out. And these two businesses are very synergistic with each other, too. Um, if you're in the licensing business, what it means is that we can be very early in a new technology area. So we can create some new thing. We can build an intellectual property portfolio for that. Um, but what, what it also means is that if that idea doesn't get out into the market, it's not valuable. So the chip business, I often look at as a distribution channel for ideas, actually. And the licensing business is the thing that allows the chip business to have access to new technology early because the licensing business is creating it. And so it's very synergistic um, between the two businesses. And then what, the, what we really have as an important facet of the company is that because we don't sell directly to the end user anymore, um, it's all about our relationships with our partners along the, the value chain. And so, in fact, when I took over in 2005, the first all hands meeting that I had, I said to the employees, I said, you know, we're known uh, as a great innovator. We're known that we hit our schedule and meet our performance targets, so we execute well. But going back to that story about the religious wars, we weren't really known as a great partner. So I said to people, the, the fundamental values of the company are going to be innovation, execution, and partnership. And then the question is, how do you get your products to market? Because we're in a technology industry where, in order to not be commoditized, we need to get the next new technology to market as fast as possible. And so we've created a lot of different strategies to get partners to want to take the next new technology. And as an example, um, you know, these days, because we're in a very leadership position with the chipsets, um, we now have our customers, whether they're large companies or smaller companies, competing to be the first one to launch a new phone with our latest chips. And we don't try and play kingmaker. We say, OK, who is it that's going to put the set of resources and has a demonstrated ability to execute to get that out to market? Because the strategy that we're using there is kind of a leapfrogging strategy. It's that if somebody wants to hold back and they don't go with the next new technology, but somebody else gets ahead of them, then everybody's forced to follow. And so this notion of, of finding the rabbits, finding the leaders that will get out there, take the newest technology, bring it into the market, drive it very hard, and then get everybody else to follow has been one that's, that's worked out incredibly well for us. And if you look at kind of the way that the company's grown, so I'll go back to, say, fiscal 10 through this year. The, the business has gone revenue side, 11 billion, 15 billion, 19 billion, and this year will go 24 and a half billion. And we've become the number one company in wireless chips. We've become the number one fabulous company. We're actually, by revenues, the number three semiconductor company now, behind only Intel and Samsung. Um, so the strategy has worked uh, extremely well. And another thing that we uh, we decided to focus on was just being as broad as we possibly could. So one of the competitive advantages that we have is not only are we driving the technology very rapidly, but we have enough scale so that when a customer is trying to get their phone into acceptance from a wireless operator, we can send a huge team of people to go knock the last few bugs out. And because we have you know hundreds, there's, I think right now we have 475 designs, different designs that are in work at different companies, 
right now. I mean, not released yet, not announced yet, but just the, the next new things. So you can imagine there's just a huge set of demands on our time to bring resources there. And so that notion of being the best partner at scale is really one of the key uh, competitive differentiators for us. Um, other, let, me, let me talk a little bit about kind of what happened uh, when, I, when I took over. So right when I took over in 05, uh, a lot of interesting things sort of happened. They were not very pleasant for me. Um, right away, we had attacks by a bunch of competitors. So I, you know, I talked about the, the wars and the resentment. And so uh, essentially companies, Ericsson and Nokia, sort of the big European telecom companies, uh, Texas Instruments, Broadcom, Panasonic, NEC, a number of different companies all sued us globally. So I, we had been this company in San Diego, we're kind of working away, we built our technology, and all of a sudden I took over, and within you know, months uh, we had a global war. And it was not just lawsuits, it was also regulatory action. So the European Union got involved looking to see are we dominant, uh, Korea looked at us, Japan looked at us, I mean, just a whole range of things. And at the time, uh, one of the things that we looked at to try and deal with that was whether we would split the company into two pieces. And so we had this notion, do we need to separate the chip business and the licensing business so that people can't use leverage on the chip business as a way to drive the licensing business down? And um, that was actually a fundamental probably the biggest question that I dealt with in the entire time that I've been CEO. And we got very close. We got down to the final board meeting. We were just about to separate out. We had already chosen you know, who was going to be the next CEO and so forth. And, uh, and I, in the end, I decided not to do it. And it was because of what I said earlier about the synergies between the chip business and the licensing business. Um, but that, was a, that, that decision and that notion that we might spin or not spin was something that actually caused a fracture in the company, which has, which has healed now, but for a very, very long time, you had those silos, the, kind of that us versus me, them mentality that I talked about earlier. And we really had to, really had to work on, on fixing that. Um, so now, the kinds of things that we do to try in and have strategies to win, um, we have this notion of scale, and we have this synergy between the businesses that I talked about. The other things that we really focus on also are the notion of integrating more capabilities into the chipset. And so, like I said earlier, we were known as a radio company. But now we actually have the best microprocessors for mobile. We have the best graphics technology for mobile, connectivity, sensors. We have a wide range of technologies. And now when people have to compete against our chips, they have to win on all of those different vectors in order to do that. And now it's sort of an arms race strategy. We're big enough that we can invest a huge amount in R&D, $4 billion in R&D last year. And we focus it in on adding new, the, what's the next new functionality. And even, so we clearly can do that at the high end, but even at the very low end of the market where we're fighting in a much more commoditized space, we continue to bring new technology down into the low end of the market in order to compete against the, uh, the companies that are trying to compete with us there. So, so the notion of integration, the notion of arms race, uh, we also try and have a very broad portfolio. And the idea there is that if you're a company that's going to try and compete with us and win at some other, at some handset manufacturer, you, you come in with one chip, you might win one product, or you might win a product in a certain tier. But because there's so much pressure on cost and the cost of developing new products, there's so much pressure on being the first to market with the next a new product, that really doesn't work. The companies don't want to have all sorts of different platforms to try and develop on. And so what we try and do is make sure that we fill all the different spaces, all the gaps in their, in the, uh, or sorry, all the tiers in their roadmap with a chip that's uh, focused on that. So we have a broad number of chips, a wide portfolio, and that way we're protected against somebody trying to come in and attack us using point solutions. And then the, then the final thing is really this notion of expanding the battlefield. And so um, we do things where we try and bring the next new technology, whether it's a new radio technology, whether it's a new microprocessor or graphics technology, but also we do these things according to the visions that I talked about. How do you, how do you interface with 
the world around us? How can we do that in an efficient manner? How can we do that without burning out the battery of the phone so that when you're walking around, you're always looking to see what services or content or people that are around you that you might want to interact with. Um, your phone's not just dying by, you know, halfway through the day because of that. So this notion uh, you know, of all these different kinds of technologies that we can put into the chip expands the battlefield. And one recent example was there's a new technology, the 4G technology coming out. And governments everywhere in the world are trying to figure out what's the new spectrum that I can put this technology in? And they're all coming up with different answers. And so what happens then is that in different countries, you take your phone and it may not even be able to connect on 4G because there's, you know, it's just running at a different part of the frequency spectrum, like a different radio station. Um, so we build a technology that will solve that problem. And it's a very integrated technology, low cost technology. That took us eight years to do. And now our competitors have to compete with that. That's another area where we've just created a new vector upon which they have to compete with us. So we're always trying to look for the next new thing to keep them behind us. And it really comes down to the innovation. And so maybe I'll close to open up with a question just quickly on how the innovation gets done. The thing like that radio chip, that came out of a traditional business unit just doing their normal Okay, how do, we, how do we build more content in the phone? How do we improve this issue that we see coming from our customers? Um, so that's a normal sort of process. You have very specific kind of gate processes for that. We also have corporate R&D, so a big engineering organization that they also have fairly formalized processes. They do sort of the next new technology. And one great thing that's just come out from there is this notion what we call supplemental downlink, where you can, you know, most of the time you're downloading stuff on your phone, and that's the, from the network to your phone is what's congested, and we came up with a way, very simply and cheaply, to allow you to add more ways to send information down rather than up, and that's something that's differentiated our, our chipsets from, uh, from the competition, but there's a wide range of technologies in there. Um, another area is we have a thing called Qualcomm Labs, which is, uh, a put, uh, organization where we try and focus in on uh, services and products. And so we have a product called Qualcomm Life 2Net, and it's a hub that connects medical equipment to a database and mashups can be done and so forth, and that, that came out of that. But we also have these things where we have very wide funnels, where we try and let everybody in the organization know that they can participate in creating new ideas. Their ideas can get into the market, and, and I tell people, I mean, with the size of Qualcomm, with the number of chips that we ship, you know, over half a billion chips in a year, um, your ideas can affect people's lives very rapidly. And so everybody in the organization is incentivized to come up with new ideas. And so we have this uh, augmented reality technology where you composite virtual objects into your scene of the real world in, uh, in your phone. And that came from an internal uh, ideas uh, competition and it didn't come out of engineering. It came out from a guy out of finance. And now that technology, um, right now there's 3,500 sorry, 3, apps in the App Store and 55,000 developers globally. And it, that didn't come exactly the way he had proposed it. It got morphed along the way. But, but there is an opportunity for everybody in the company to innovate. And that's, I think, the thing that you know, really is the core of our competitive advantage. So maybe I'll stop talking and just give you guys a chance to ask some questions. What area of technology uh, do you worry about that might be disruptive to, to your industry? Uh, I mean, we're always worried about things that might disrupt the wireless operator's business model. So, um, you know, more of our money comes from licensed band technology, you know, the things that like a, a Verizon and AT&T, uh, T-Mobile, Sprint, those guys run. Uh, so we always have watched Wi-Fi as an example. But we actually now know, based on some new work that we've done, that if you're trying to get mass volumes of data through, and we're working on an idea called a thousand X, which is getting a thousand times more data through the system at a thousand times lower cost. Uh, it, the, the issue with, uh, with Wi-Fi is that these things don't coordinate and they actually interfere with each other. And so we've looked at Wi-Fi as a, Comp competition in addition to a complementary technology, obviously, because it is 
complementary, but we worried, could it be competitive in the future? We said, okay, what are its issues, and let's go solve those issues in the license band technology. Now, what we want to do is adopt also the good sides of Wi-Fi, like people feel like, hey, I'm using Wi-Fi, I can have unlimited data, I don't need to worry about it. We're going to solve that problem by driving the cost per bit delivered over the network on the cellular networks down very dramatically, a thousand times. So, you know, we'll, we'll try and solve those problems, give you what you want, but give the same reliability and the scalability that you get out of the licensed technologies. That's probably the, probably the top thing that we, we think about. But, you know, we, it's so broad, we think about, uh, you know, integrated circuit technology, you know, all the way down at the bottom of the process, all the way up to sort of applications and, and so forth. Hi, my name is Ambrose Gaina. I'm a first-year MBA here, and I worked at SMIC in Shanghai before coming to the GSB. Um, looking into the future, I'd like to hear what technology trends are exciting for you and for Qualcomm. Okay, so the things that, we, you know, we have, a, we have a certain set of growth opportunities ahead of us right now. So we're, we see, obviously, the smartphone revolution as being one that's here and now, and it's got, you know, a lot of legs to it. Uh, we see the opportunity to extend that into the emerging markets. So growth in the emerging markets is going to be dramatic. And there, it's actually a technology issue. You've got to drive the cost down very dramatically so that the price points are affordable for, for people at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, then we kind of look out and we say, okay, what are the next set of things? And we're a little bit in the middle of the next one, which is just redefining what computing is. So, Tablets, you know, it's, I still see people with laptops, but I think increasingly you will see fewer and fewer people carrying around laptops. I actually don't carry a laptop anymore myself. Um, and so I, I think, you know, that redefining of the way that computing goes, and then by extension, redefining of entertainment and the connected home, and so the connected enterprise, connected home. Um, and then this 1000X, the notion that we're actually going to extend the network and make the cellular system deployed more like Wi-Fi. And then once you do that, you can imagine that those things can actually be some sort of a technology to allow you to interact with things in your house. We can put all sorts of other things in that as a gateway technology. So that's, that's pretty exciting. And then, as I said, this notion of the, of the digital sixth sense. So this idea that we'll have connectivity in all the things in the world around us that the phone will act, or whatever device, might be a watch, might be glasses, you know, might, however it is, whatever device it is that you're using as your main way to interact will sort of allow you to know what's around you. And one of the technologies that we're, we're working on there, making a big investment in, is on the display side, where um, right now, you know, it's, it's bizarre because normally you put your phone down on the table and you, know, you see a dead screen and you think, well, that thing's off, but really, this thing is on the network. It's sucking down my email. It's updating my calendar, my contacts, my Facebook, my whatever. You know, it's doing all that stuff, but it just looks like it's dead. And wouldn't it be nice if it was just on and it could alert me when things were around me? And you can see how that sort of plays into this notion that I said that the phone will tell you when there's services or content or other things that are around you that you might want to interact with. So the idea of a continuous interaction model with always on screens and other sorts of user interface that might talk to you. Those things I think are exciting. And then if I look kind of in the five to ten year time frame, because it's going to really take those kinds of time frames, you know, this is an early indicator of mobile health, but I think mobile health will absolutely change the way healthcare is done. It will solve a problem which is an incredibly bad problem, which is healthcare is basically bankrupting the developed world and it's not available enough in the developing world, and so we're going to solve those issues as well. Uh, in your vision-based approach with Qualcomm, how do you think about focus while having uh, that very broad portfolio? So, what, so it's, it does allow us to focus, and in various organizations, there are different mechanisms that, that have gate processes, for example. So a business unit, ideas will come up, and then they have to go through sort of a winnowing process. And for things that are relatively small, we allow sort of more bubbles to be bubbling in the pot. And when they get bigger and bigger, then you get in and, you, and you, you're much more specific about, okay, this one we will continue, this one we'll allocate more resources to, this one you can continue, won't have so many resources, this other one, let's stop that one or put it on the shelf. And so um, generally you can see uh, projects in the company 
by the number of people they attract. So certain things are just done naturally, but the ones that are just random and kind of out there and floating around, if it's a, somebody with an idea in the company and they're working on it, then if it's a good one, then their friends come work on it. And after a little while, you see there's a set of people working on it, and then it can be managed too. So all the way from things that are very formalized down to just ideas that are randomly bubbling up, we, we can actually get in and then, then manage those processes. And that's actually worked quite well. Um, I'm just going with whoever gets the microphone, so. So as a leader of a large organization that's so complex, my question is, especially when you reach times of conflict, um, like in 06 when you took over, what, what do you, how did you go about creating channels of information that you could rely on? Um, and, and furthermore, creating a group of advisors who you could trust and who you could bounce ideas off in order to make these types of decisions? So a lot of the people in the senior team have been together for a very long time, so we're, we're actually all friends. I mean, with this, the, the executive vice presidents at Qualcomm hang out together outside of work even. I mean, we like each other. And so we don't have the political issues that you have in, certain, in other organizations we've seen, you know, with companies that we work with. So people actually don't generally look at if something's going wrong or something needs to be done and somebody else comes in and helps out, it's not seen as, oh, you're stepping into my turf trying to steal my glory. It's like, thanks, I needed some help, I was overloaded. And so just having that culture right off causes information to flow. And it, it goes along with what I said about the, the networks and so forth, that people create these networks and information flows to where people are, are adding value. Um, I did have to change out my legal team, um, at least at the top level, because in the beginning, we were very good. We're not, we, people have this impression that Qualcomm was a litigation company and we never were. We were a licensing company. There were times when we had some litigation, but it was generally a onesie twosie kind of thing. And there, it was almost like the kid with the soccer, you know, the soccer team swarming to the soccer ball. So if you could focus on one or two things, you could do a great job. When it became a worldwide thing, that didn't work and we had to have more structure. We actually brought in uh, somebody from the outside who had been at IBM for a long time, went to Apple for a short stint and then came to work with us. And he had a lot of outside um, relationships that he could then bring to us. And so it was a combination of depending on sort of the group of people and we're just pulling together and focus, you know, getting focus and bring a few specific people in from the outside. So uh, essentially, as you pointed out yourself, you know, not just companies, but the world is a very siloed place. How does Qualcomm go about basically getting its ideas from the rest of the world, finding those best ideas, looking at trends, because technology is now developed all over the place? So one of the, one thing is we, you know, we have so many employees and they talk with their friends and they are on the internet, you know, so we pick stuff up that way. Um, some of the more formal methods is we have a venture fund. The venture fund is actually under the chief technology officer, not under finance, um, not under the treasury function. And its primary goal is to be a sensor. And so they actually are out there looking for companies that we might want to partner with and then have, you know, uh, build, build technology with or integrate their capabilities in, into our products. Um, but, it, you know, it comes from a lot of things. And I think the, the key lesson is you've got to be willing to accept uh, diverse inputs. You know, I, I just feel that incredibly strongly that if you allow yourself to get locked into one way of thinking, you only listen to the people around you, you're going to blow it because you're just going to, you're going to miss the thing that's coming in from the side. And one of the, one of the things I always tell people is like if, if you hear somebody tell you something that everybody believes, what the conventional wisdom is, go examine the assumptions that underlie that con conventional wisdom because they're almost always wrong and there's a way to go create something new. And CDMA was a great example of that where everybody thought you had to do one kind of technology, you did another. The Omnitrax example that I said early on where people thought you had to launch your own satellite, but you didn't, you could do it another way. Um, when we did uh, the Brew software download system, people thought that you had to build a sandbox to sandbox the applications. and and keep them away from the hardware, and we said, no, we can sign the applications and authenticate them. So, I mean, all along the history of the company, we've, we've done things where we kind of look around and say, okay, what's the world doing? How do we create an open space for ourselves by 
examining the assumptions too. So we, we do that, you know, we gather information almost as a way to stimulate what could be done differently. Stanford alum, I also am a San Diego native, so thank you for what you and your family have done for the city. Oh. My question is about your reference to Qualcomm Stadium, and I know that the, the term of that deal expires in 2017, so I'm just curious, if you were to do another 20-year deal, hypothetically, finances aside, what would some of the technologies that you've talked about today bring to life in a consumer-rich environment like a stadium? Some of the sixth sense you talked about was really interesting. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're actually doing some work already. We've made an announcement with Major League Baseball where we're going in and helping them optimize the stadiums. Part of that will be some of this 1,000x idea where we're going to have a lot of small cells all distributed around and manage the interference and just in, increase the capacity in the network. But um, we have this, uh, this context awareness technology called Gimbal. It's being used right now for the Star Trek app in case any of you guys care. Um, but it, basically, it's the idea of when you go to certain locations, you win points, you finish missions or whatever. And you can imagine this will get used in a stadium environment to tell you where to go to, you know, if you want to order things or give you some information about what's going on around you or even give you information about the, um, the sporting event. Um, we're also working on radio technologies that will, at a much lower power, allow you to discover things in the environment around you and much, much more simply. And we have a, a technology called AllJoin, which is an open source project where all we're trying to do is create a common way for all of this internet of everything to talk to each other. And so you may come into an environment and something will say, okay, you're sitting at this seat, you have the ability to order here, or you can pull up this content about the game, or you can pull up this camera angle. Or, I mean, you can imagine a million different things that might happen. Or I walk in and I'm a, I'm a um, season ticket holder, so I get something special for that. Or I gave my tickets to somebody else that day, and therefore they can you know, benefit from what I, you know, what I was getting. And so all sorts of different ideas about how we can do that. And I think we'll definitely see that. And uh, in addition to, uh, I mean, I don't, it's going to be hard to get a new stadium built in, uh, in uh, San Diego because of the politics. But I'm also involved in this uh, thing for the Sacramento Kings, so, and we'll be building a new arena in Sacramento, and I'm hope, hopeful that we'll put some pretty cool technology in there to really make a great fan experience. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I have a question for you. I, I do feel that you have a lot of enthusiasm for this uh, Internet of Things and the Sixth Sense. Um, was wondering if you can share with us uh, a little bit more color on how quickly do you think the ecosystem is developing? You know, what momentum we see in the ecosystem, and uh, if you can share what you see as you know the killer app, you know, that would uh, kickstart this whole thing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think there's going to be a bunch of different killer apps. I mean, some of them will come. Um, early from, one example is there's a big push in consumer electronics around smart TV. And to me, a smart TV was this idea that you're going to run smartphone apps on your TV, which I always thought was somewhat lame. And I didn't believe in it that much. Um, but what, one of the things I showed at my CES keynote is something that I do believe in, which is the idea that I will have my tablet or my smartphone, my friends will have their tablet, smartphone. And the screen that we use, because they're getting to be large and high resolution, that'll actually be the communal space. So we'll be watching the broadcast, and we'll post different things that we're interested in, so you have both a private and a public aspect. So that, that's sort of an entertainment aspect of working with a, a screen. But you can imagine the business aspect of it. I come into a, in a, into a meeting with other people, and instead of passing out PowerPoints, everybody has a set of slides on their device, and I want to show, you know, we're talking, and I want to show this slide on the screen, and I post it, and it, and it goes up on the screen because I'm talking to the projector, but it also can get sent around to everybody else's devices so that they can have it, they can comment on it, they might be able to edit it. So the notion in real time creating ad hoc groups, I think, will be another interesting one. Uh, one that we're having a lot of uh, success with right now is, is in the telematics area. So getting things built into cars, we, you know, making the car connected. But today, when you get in your car with your phone, you have to pair the Bluetooth up, and you get in and out of the car, and you're on a call, and the Bluetooth doesn't know to drop when you get out of the car. 
car and you can't really, it's not that easy to get your content in and out. I mean, if you have an iPhone or iPod and you, you have a phone, I'm sorry, a car with a plug, it's a little bit easier, but you still don't have a very rich environment to interact with it. And so what's going to happen in the future is you're going to get in the car, the phone's going to say to the car, this is Paul Jacobs, here's his preferences, here's the content that he has. The car's going to say to my phone, this is the screen, here's the speakers, here's the buttons, here's the other things that you can control in the car. But even better, when my friends get into the car, they're also going to be authorized then to send their content to the stereo system. So we can all have a, you know, a jukebox together or something and say, you know. So all sorts of interesting things where we'll be able to change the way the car works. We're going to do the same thing in retail. So I was giving a, you know, some of the examples in the context of sports, but you can imagine walking in, you can get loyalty applications, you can get offers and things like that. And we're, the technology that we're building which I like a lot, is one which preserves anonymity. So instead of walking into a store and saying, Paul Jacobs just walked into the store, what do you know about Paul Jacobs to send him information? What will happen is the store will know, or my phone will know that I walked into a store. And not necessarily that I will then tell the store it's me. It may be that it will just say, this is a person with these kinds of characteristics. Do you want to give? an offer to that person, and I'll have opted into it. And the technology actually came out of you know, trying to figure out how to track um, lost children, and it's sort of an, uh, an evolution of that uh, into more of a commercial space. But um, I think that technology is going to be really interesting. Because back in the days when we first GP put GPS into the phone, people used to say to me things like, oh, well, when you're walking by McDonald's, McDonald's is going to send you a coupon. I'm like. I don't want McDonald's knowing where I am at all times so that just when I happen to walk by, they can send me a coupon. To me, it's much more interesting that McDonald's might be broadcasting something that my phone will walk through, see that that offer is there. If I actually care about McDonald's, it will alert me, buzz here, here, here. You know, Something will happen that I'll know, and then I can react to it. If I'm not interested, those bits just get dropped on the floor. I walk by, nobody knows anything. You know. They don't know any, anything that I went by or anything. So those kind of technologies are going to roll out in the, in the very near future as well and, and give us this opportunity to interact with the world around us in a much more rich fashion. OK, you told me that I need to stop at 1, and it's just past 1. So Yeah, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this afternoon. But um, please join me in thanking Paul for his presentation. Thanks, everybody.